Hi, have a seat. Hi. Welcome to the data stage. <laughs> Thank you. Data stage. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, could you please uh, introduce yourselves? Go ahead, my friend. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Pierre, um, the founder and CEO of uh, Side. So at Side, we, uh, we empower people and companies by providing the best temp work uh, experience. So the temp work uh, is ADECO, Manpower, Randstadt, maybe you know these guys. So it's really old school temp agencies you can see in the street. And so we're, we're replacing the, the network of agencies by technology and product to actually transform what may seem today uh, as something quite precarious to work as temp worker as an opportunity. And so we're helping thousands of people every, every month work um, flexibly in companies in the retail industry, uh, in the logistics industry, and in many, many offices um, in, uh, in Paris and in seven different cities uh, in France. And so we've been um, working on site for three years now. We are 80 in the company. And, um, and yeah, we, we are obliged to, to, to work with a lot of data uh, as we have a lot of people working every day um, with different companies um, in different cities. And so to keep a very close eye on our activity and make sure that um, the, the, the activity is, is run properly. Uh, we've been working a lot on, on, on data, so happy to, happy to talk uh, about it with you guys. Thank you. And I'm Paul, I'm the, the, one of the co-founder and the CEO of Fredlink. Uh, at Fredlink, we bring the trucking industry to the next level, which is a, a very sexiest, uh, it has been called the, un, the, 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 the unsexiest trillion dollar market. It's not a, a really sexy market when you see that from uh, the back, but it's really, really interesting. And what we do at Fredlink is that we connect the industrial shippers like uh, Carrefour, Procter & Gamble, uh, Cronenbourg, etc., to uh, the largest network of uh, reliable and connected regional truck company uh, and to do so uh, we build a, a SaaS platform uh, to help them budget, plan and optimize their, their transportation plan uh, every day. Uh, we, the, the funny thing is that we started with the same day, uh, we side, we, we, we joined the family the, the, the same day, uh, pretty to see that we are still here and we are 75 in the company um, after three years um, uh, of building the company, two years of uh, operational uh, um, uh, operational uh, operation, two years of operation, and uh, yeah, the data is pretty uh, important in, especially in our industry, that not only it allows us to manage our company, we are now 75 and we are growing more and more month after month, uh, uh, with new people, need new department, new, new skills in the company, that's really important to, uh, to manage our company and to drive our growth through the data, but it, it's also something really operational for us, uh, because we are building an end-to-end data-driven model in the trucking industry that, that, that doesn't exist for the moment, and it had all us to pretty uh, um, closely understand uh, what, what what happened on the picking up, on the different deliveries, the, diffi the different litigation, what is the, the, the best slot that you can find to make you deliver, etc. thanks to the data. So not only it, it allows us to, to better manage our company, but also to better understand our operation and, and provide our customer with more, um, a better service. Thank you. So if we start and we go back in time a little bit, so kind of probably the time that you joined the, the family, how did you test your market or your problem before even building your product? And so it, yeah, so it was the very, very beginning then. <coughs> um, the first thing we did is we created a, f a fake landing page um, with fake jobs with their um, pro value proposition. Um, and so it was very easy to do. We had a sign up button because we wanted to, to see if people were interested in getting a better experience of temp work. <laughs> And so we posted this landing page online, um, and we thought that we would get 10 signups. <laughs> and, and, and the day after, actually, we, we had hundreds of people who signed up. So it was very surprising for us. And um, yes, that's, that's how we faked it in the beginning. And then that's how we realized that a lot of people were interested in what, what we were thinking about. And so then we started um, talking to these people and um, getting their feedback on what they expected from a service that the one we wanted to build. And um, yeah, and finally, that's how we created the product. It's really to m make it based on the, uh, on the feedback we got from these guys in the beginning. 
Yeah, and that's something which is something that, that we learn also at the family, something very new, the, the, the fake it until you make it. Uh, like a couple of years ago, 10, 20 years ago, you had to, to build a company, you had to spend thousands and, and thousands of, 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 I would say, euro, no, but franc at, at that time, uh, to build everything, to build your product, and after go on the market to, to see if there were a product market fit. Uh, today, it's almost free to, to build a startup, to build a landing page, to build your service and to see if you get interest, if you get a market fit. And that's also what happened at, uh, at Fretling. Basically, the, the first customer that we had was Chanel uh, for the perfumes. And uh, uh, we managed to get that rendezvous with Chanel's and we basically had prepared some mock-ups, some design mock-ups of the platform and told the guy that we were ready to launch the week after, but basically we didn't even start to, to build the product. Um, and, and we basically sold the, the, this, uh, this, this product design and, and, and the, the cool thing is that um, we managed to build the product with that customer because obviously he told us, oh, that's your product and you are going to launch it. But the problem is that you should have, you should have put that button here. We should have loved to get that features to, to classify all our expeditions, shipment, etc. And we were just like taking all the notes and getting back to work and say, okay, now we know how to build the products. And, uh, and we, of course, it takes months, months after months. We were like, no, we just like, just wait one more week. We're just finalizing the last test on the platform. So you have to iterate a bit for a, a couple of months, but basically, of course, uh, and even more because we are in B2B and that uh, everything takes a lot of time, e even for the corporates that we are targeting. Basically, it takes a couple of months, but a couple of months later, we, we build that, that minimum viable product, that product, and, and finally start the first test with Chanel. So that, that's the way we, we started with our first customer. And um, so, as you said, when you first uh, built your product, how did you go about uh, making sure it was a sticky product? What was that process? Except just uh, noting down and moving around buttons. Uh, <clears throat> that, uh, making sure that it was sticky, mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with uh, our users, um, and uh, and which is uh, pretty g even more complex. I think that it's always complicated to get stickiness on your product, and that's something that you are, have to build from day one, and that's even more complicated on our case uh, when the, 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 the final user is a Michelin that has been used to, to work on the tracking industry and work the, the, the small post-it to work on the expansion and that you explain that you are now going to use on a, on a, data, on a data driven s software as a service. So basically that was pretty complicated because the, our user uh, were not used to basically in, in their everyday life is the, 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 people that don't use Airbnb or, or don't even use Facebook and when, and when you are with your product when on, their, on a B2B, on, their professional, uh, on the professional side, that even more complicated for them to get used to, the, to those new habits. So basically, uh, <coughs> to get stickiness, we, we took a lot of time with our user to, to make some training, because if you don't have stickiness at the beginning, that's not because your service is not relevant. It may be because like, the user don't know how to use it. Uh, so of course, we took a lot of time to train them on our product. And the second topic that we had is to uh, make diversification on our services uh, to build stickiness, uh, because of course, the core value <coughs> <coughs> that we uh, provide them with at Fretling is to, um, on the shipper side, to provide them with a, an interface to plan their shipment and to find capacities on the on our solution. On the other side, for the trucking companies to uh, uh, <coughs> to, to, um, to to fill their trucks. But basically, we see that there were a lot of things that we can provide them with, like per customer dashboard, new services, new features to help them take decision on their everyday business uh, to automatization of different tasks that they had and that they, they spend a lot of time. So basically, by building different services around our core feature, we managed to get more and more stickiness and basically get more capacities on the tracking side and more and more shipment on the, on the shipper side. And Pierre? Yeah, um, <laughs> so for us, um, we really wanted to build something for companies <coughs> that um, they could use uh, autonomously. So we are marketplaces. And so we connect two sides. And we're not SaaS, or we're not customer startups, which are, I think, uh, from the beginning, way more um, probably data-driven in terms of the use of the product. For us, the use of the product is quite easy. It's like, when you're talking to a customer, and usually they were using a phone, and they were used to calling someone, 
that's the old habit you're trying to replace by your product. So if your customer is doing this, it means that there's no stickiness on your product because your customer doesn't use your product. He's still picking the phone and calling your salesperson or account manager. So you see if it works, if it, what you can improve, or if it doesn't work, by simply tracking how autonomous the, the customers are uh, on the product. And so that's something that we've been, we, we've been building from, from the beginning. In the beginning, there, were, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of, of manual work. Um, from our, our side, and today we have very, very big customers who are using the product on their own, and they love it because it creates a, you, a new, a new usage. And, and and sometimes uh, when we say fake it until you make it, it's not only uh, on the making the, the the first design, the first product, and make sure that you share it with your first early adopter to make sure that it's the right product to build. But also in your operation, something that uh, uh, we did at the beginning is to uh, even fake on our product the different stages and the different uh, when we start uh, the, the operation. There were uh, some features that looks autonomous on the cheaper side but basically we had people every day <laughs> clicking on the on the button to to make it auto, uh, to 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 to, um, uh, to 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 give them the impression that it was uh, auto full automated and that the features was already launched but basically by doing that even if you have people that doing internally and that that they fake it basically you have a um, you have some you just validate the different e hypotheses that you have on your product and you make sure that is the right product and that's more easy to have the right product and to have customer that use your product every day but you have it's not on auto autonomous enough and you have people that doing every day and on the second step you automate the different tasks that basically uh, start without product and with a uh, we, we by spending all the day with you uh, we, um, with the phone well and basically uh, just to, to, to conclude on that everyone needs to be aware that at, at Uber a company that everyone knows at the beginning and at Deliveroo as well uh, basically there are a lot of tasks that you saw at the beginning that were completely done by the algorithm or completely automated on the app and there were like hundreds of people behind that were managing and calling the cabs and managing the relation every day but you, but basically from your side you say Uber is an incredible app you just have to click on an app and you get everything done by the algorithm automatically no basically there were hundreds of people at the beginning and they, they had a, a room that they called the post-it room they were all like running with the different post-it that was Uber in the first years but basically they managed to raise funds they managed to, to get everyone on board and once it was done they just raised funds hire a lot of uh, dev, the web developers to build the product and to automate tax as a time, but they add their product market fit. So always think about it, I, this example. That, that I think that's the way to do it. And uh, so if we uh, move forward a bit to uh, today or the last uh, few years in your company, uh, which ones are your most important KPIs or have they changed during time? Um, yeah, so the, the, the KPIs we, um, we look at today are pretty simple. They are uh, revenue KPIs, um, customer satisfaction KPIs, like NPS on both sides, and margin. So for cash, and because we're a marketplace and we need to keep an eye on um, how expensive it is to deliver the service. And that's usually what the product <coughs> enables to do is to uh, um, increase the, the margin. So today we're looking at, at, at revenue, uh, NPS, are the, our user happy, and, and margins, contribution margins. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it definitely changed, and I would just like uh, bounce on what I've just said before. At the beginning, we were trying to, uh, we were really focusing on, and basically we still do every day of course on our uh, business volume the margin that we take on the, the, the operation but of course as we move forward we get we got more and more uh, granulate on our data uh, we, we have the, the general data that we have on the company that drive the business growth etc but basically the, the more granulate we are uh, and the more we manage to understand what we are doing and the, the way to, to, to where we are the bottlenecks and where we have to focus to make it better uh, basically uh, the, uh, a KPI that we didn't track at the beginning was the contributive margin because we know we knew that that was a really people intensive play at the beginning we work on an industrial complex supply chain world and the product was like just like a couple of interface at the beginning 
of course trying to to say oh but they are just exactly what i said before do you have three people that are clicking all the day long and your contributive margin so what, what is that when you pay people after what you you pay people to to serve your customers that was not relevant to to to, to track that kpi at the beginning because I, basically i just didn't care I, that was okay for me to have 10 people clicking every day on the on the product to to fake that it was a completely autonomy i just wanted to have Carrefour and the Procter and Gamble and and Heineken uh, say, oh, that's the future of supply chain and that's the product that we want to use tomorrow. And now, of course, and that's pretty recent, we are now tracking the contributive margin, the, the efficiency that we have on operation, the number of automated tasks that we have through the process. But of course, it changed along the, 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 the way because it depends on what you are focusing on. And, and basically, uh, what you want to improve. That's something that you have to get in mind is that a KPI that you track will always be um, improved. Even if you don't do anything for that. When you track something, it gets better. Anyway, we just like unconsciously, you just like the, from the, all the decision that you take all the day long, you have that KPI and without making any like proper action on it, just like look at that KPI and um, and uh, and we'll make better. At the beginning, at some point, we had like dozen and dozen of KPIs, and that was really complicated. And we decided at Fretling to say, okay, we are going to look at the KPIs that we want to improve in the next month or in the next quarter. And that was funny to think that at some point we saw that some KPIs that we didn't even take action on that just just like gets better because unconsciously in the team we were. We were we were driven by the the, Im the improvement of that uh, of that KPI. Yeah, and, and in the beginning, um, I think it's important to have maybe one KPI that you follow, because the KPI is sorry what uh, Paul is saying now is <coughs> it's it's your focus. So in the beginning, it's like you're in a plane and you're trying to take off. So you just have to look at maybe the speed of your plane and then you take up at some point. And then once you're up there in the air, it's important to uh, keep an eye on m more things than just uh, your speed. And, uh, um, but in the beginning, if you try to look at too many things first, you will ne never have enough tracking to, to do it um, because it takes time to build all the tools and then all the reporting to actually get visibility on what matters. So in the beginning, the, the, the real question is what KPIs is a real KPI of success. And revenue, of course, is one, but what does it mean? Is it the number of clients? Is it the, 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 the average revenue per client? Or you know, many different things. And target maybe one, and, and, and then try to increase this KPI. And then I think as we grow as companies, we add more and more and more and more. Um, yeah, and we, which is normal. But in the beginning, it's, it's a mistake to focus on too many things when you're in survival mode and there's only one thing that matters. Yeah, For two reasons. The first one is that you have to build your product and every time you want to track a new KPI, you, you want to uh, get a report, you have to ask your dev team, okay, we need new dashboard, etc. And that you, you that, that's the time that you don't, you, you don't put on your uh, product. And the second thing is that uh, to improve a KPI, you need to work with your team on a new process, on, on something new. And you, if you track like 80 KPIs at the beginning with a 10, 15, 20 or 30 uh, people in your team, you are not able to improve all your KPIs. And even worse, I'm not saying that because I have my VC in the... My, my investors in the room, um, uh, but the, the worst thing is that sometimes you and even I, I would say some in the relation that you can have with your investors, and that's happened to to, to us. We have Daphne and Elayar in in our capital. We we didn't say it, but we have both of the people that you see before on uh, on our capital at Fretlink, and um, and basically. Uh, um, if you track too many KPIs, uh, there are some KPIs that you show that you don't work on, and that can, that can everyone can feel like what what happened? It doesn't improve. But you are not working on the KPI. It's just a KPI that you put on your report. And not only it takes time to build a KPI, but for people like investors or people around the company, they can think like. Yeah, they just provide me with that KPI every month, but I don't, don't see any improvement. Maybe there is a problem. No, it's just that we are not working on that KPI. Don't put it in your report. Just say we have three main focus in the next quarter. We want to improve the average basket per customer. We want to have rid our to improve our say like uh, our conversion rate on that part of the funnel and we are going to keep an eye on it and be very focused on our execution and, and just talk about those KPIs that you want to improve. Yeah, I can really agree with that. That's sometimes startups come to me and like, oh, we need to track these and these and these and I want to have all these numbers in my dashboard. But 
usually what I, I try to tell them is that let's focus and, and let's pick uh, a couple of them that you focus on and then uh, you switch focus after a while when you've managed to improve it. Okay, so in your companies uh, today, how do you measure these KPIs and what kind of people uh, or uh, which roles uh, in your companies have the responsibility of data analysis? Um, so we have a, an amazing uh, BI team um, that we've built very early. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it's true that you will, you will never be able to track everything from the beginning because it's the work of an entire team. <laughs> and you need to understand that because there are a lot of conferences about being data-driven, you know, and so in the beginning you want to be data-driven, but it's very hard because <laughs> you don't have the tools, you don't have the teams to do the reportings, you and data, so. you don't have data, you don't, have, you don't know what to track, you don't have your model. So that's why in the beginning just focus on one and then go, and then it will come. Uh, but keep in, keep in mind that it's, um, it's important to start building a I think a BI team very early, and so one of the things that we, that we did very early was um, working with Salesforce as a CRM, um, which I think was a very good decision. It was a big CRM for our uh, stage, um, but that's how we, we got a lot of data on the, our performance and our, our, our sales performance, especially. And so, um, yeah, now we have um, six people in BI, and so we are distributing the analysts also in different teams. So it's important. There are two things that are important. First is to have the right tools. So it's very hard to collect data without the right tools. So Salesforce is a good tool. So we, there are some competitors that may be good also. But, um, you have to name three, you know, the competitors. Yeah. <laughs> Pipedrive <Okay>. and... Uh, <laughs> and HubSpot. HubSpot, yeah. Um, and, um, <laughs> Same thing for customer support, same thing for HR, same thing for everything. So pick the right tools. And these tools have some analytics in there. And that's how you're going to get the data. And then centralizing the data in the BI team is very important because not everyone knows how to deal with data. And you're looking for, for, for people who have an analytical mind, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that's true, to make decisions and to understand how to prioritize based on data. But to work on collecting the data and to um, analyzing it and to giving it as an information um, to the team is a lot of work. And um, that's the work of one team today at SIDE, uh, which is the, the BI team. And it's, uh, yeah, I think it's very important to, to have that. So one is the, the tools. And then the second one is also you have some data that will come from product because you, you have your user who are using your product and sometimes you, you need some data from that. So it's important to gather this data. And when you build your product, you don't only visit, build it for the experience of your users, but you also build it for the data that you need then to give to your BI team. So it's also something very important um, to keep in mind. So that's your internal tools, if you want, that you need to build always with the same goals, collect the data that you need. And then once you have the data, you need to work with this data to actually uh, learn something from it and drive uh, your team <coughs> and uh, yeah and, and 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 so that's kind of like the the, the two different roles that we have today outside um, the tooling and then the the, the, the analysis and um, yeah and we have dedicated people by teams so we have people dedicated for the sales team who are going to provide um, intelligence for the sales team uh, same thing for the for the ops team same thing for the product team and so, yeah, having dedicated people, I think, is, um, is, is great because it, it, it gives them a, a focus that is very operational. Um, because, you know, when you are surrounded by data in your BI team, one of the risks is to get lost into what is really important in terms of real data, you know, you, because you can actually uh, get many information that actually you don't care about. And sometimes you have people coming like, oh, I found something great. And actually, it doesn't really matter. Uh, whereas when you have an analyst that is close to the ops, or an analyst that is close to the sales team, or an analyst that's close to the product team, then you know what's, uh, they know that what's important, and they know what is going to, um, to drive the team uh, to success. And so, um, so the BI team uh, should not stay 
on their own, they should, I think, be distributed in the different business units, but, be, but report to only one person, because otherwise you, you will never be sure of the quality of the data. So one person should be responsible for uh, that data is the truth. And so, yeah, that's how we, we are organized today, I'd say. Very, very well organized. I'm not going to talk on, the, on that part. <laughs> we are not that well organized at Fretlink, um, to be honest. No, no, that, that's really funny because basically we, we don't, didn't have the, the same track uh, at Fretlink. And the reason why, the, the main reason is that at some point we have to make a choice. Um, we, we experienced a big growth this year, just to give you figures. Uh, we did uh, 1 million turnover the first year, 2017, and we did uh, 15 million uh, turnover this year. So we grew by more, more, more than, than, than 15 uh, our turnover in one year. So that was, and we grew the team from 10 to 75 in, in 12 months. So that was pretty intense in terms of grow, hiring people, etc. And as we are operating on, a, on, on complex supply chain for Carrefour, the, 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 the different brand that, that, that we talked before, um, that we are at some point we have to make that choice because data, uh, I'm not saying that data is not important for uh, Pierre customer, but but basically the data is the core things, one of the core things for our customers. We are, we are building intelligence, data intelligence for, uh, for our big shippers in, in Europe. And we, uh, at some point we, could, we couldn't do everything. So we had to make the choice. Either we build a, a BI team uh, and we have a better understanding and a fine understanding of our operation and what we do uh, in terms of managing the sales, etc., etc., or we build the stack for our customers. And we had like Carrefour and Procter and Gamble and Ferrero that was like every month we want customized data-driven tools, etc., and we could we couldn't do the both. So we decided to focus on our customers and we build a, an incredible stack. Uh, basically, it's our product manager with the data science team that work on that uh, with the account managing team uh, at Fretlink and uh, the, the three account management, account management uh, product management and data scientists, they work on the, all that stack for our customers. So now we have incredible dashboard for our customers that they can perfectly understand they have like maps with bubbles about the delivery, what happened on that side or on that side, etc. That's really powerful and I, I'm sure that we managed to, to win uh, uh, over our competitors on that features that we launched. But unfortunately, we couldn't do, do, like, do it at the same time. So basically, today, the, 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 that's pretty recently that we are, uh, that we are uh, d decided and start to build the, 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 the business intelligence at Fretlink. I mean, for the company, and it's the, the, the financial part that, 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 that handled that for the moment. Our CFO, Chief Financial Officer, and his team that manage all the data and that provide us with report and, and different strategy and operational report, etc. So that's pretty interesting. And the funny thing is that on that growth, going from 10 to 75, going from 1 million to 15 million, we were like going every week on the new challenge, new customer, etc. And a couple of months ago, when we started to put the trackers on the company, we saw incredible things. There were people in the company that uh, were losing like money every day or losing shipment or doing incredible things every day, but we were in the growth and, and really focused on our customers. And that was an incredible, an incredible moment when you just switch on the lights on every single detail on our operation and sales team. And we saw incredible things uh, uh, at that moment. And that, of course, that was the moment where we started to really structurate the company around the data, uh, structuring our process, our operation. But basically, that's funny because we, could, we couldn't do everything in a single time. And we, we basically, basically chose to, to focus on the, the stack for customers instead of our internal BA. Uh, but we see that it's obviously very, very po powerful to have your, your own uh, team in the business intelligence. Cool. Thank you. I think we have uh, time for one or two questions from the audience. When you're facing a, a hard situation, like you have to choose between user experience and the need of uh, data collection, how do you um, manage to to choose uh, the, to uh, put in favor the user experience, or you need to collect data? Uh, the, that was a, a no-brainer for us. Basically, when you grow. Uh, if there were a problem in our group, we would have focused on the different bottlenecks. 
basically that worked. We saw that we were like getting more and more customer, more and more shipment. That the, our we were like we had an exponential growth. So basically, when you use your data, is to improve it. Uh, is to improve the way it works. But it has to work. When it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and you see it directly on your revenue or basically nothing happens and you say, oh, I have a problem in my company, I should focus on my product feed, etc. When you grow, basically you say, okay, that works. I, but now it works at like 40, 50 percent. I have, a, let's say, if, you, if, you, if, if we talk about the conversion rate on your funnel, you say today, day after day, I acquire more and more customer, but I have a 20 percent conversion rate on my acquisition funnel. But basically, you can, with the data, you can go to 25, 30, 35, 40 percent of conversion, ra conversion rate. But the first focus that you have is that, do you need to go from 20 to 30 or 35? Or basically you need to, to, uh, to, to provide your customer with a better service to make sure that they are, that they are keep going on and keep like, ordering on your service or keep using our service. So basically the trade-off that we had at Fretting is that, Basically, it works. We have more and more customers, more and more shipment, and we are growing. We can do much better on that part, but basically, we'll see that later on. But basically, we had customers that every day say, okay, now you acquired us, but we need more and more services, and we need customized dashboard, etc. cetera. We, we didn't have the choice. Otherwise, we would have just lost those customers. So we just focus on what were really useful. And now that our customers are really happy that they have customized that board and that we are signing three years contract with big supply chain in Europe, now we can say, okay, 20% is not enough on our conversion rate. I'm going to, bu to build a BI team to see what's going on. And now we can go to 25, 30, 35%, but that was not the, the first focus that we have at, at that point. Yeah, we, we, I think we had the opposite um, <laughs> approach. <laughs> yeah, um, because we tried to, yeah, we, we, we tried to build the model and we, we managed to do it, but it took time. <clears throat> Which means to understand like how everything breaks down and so that you can, because you can see what's inside and you can see uh, what works, what doesn't work. Even if you don't actually focus on this, you actually know. And so, um, I think there is no UX versus um, um, data. Um, it's design should be for the user and for the data. And so I think that's something very important that we discovered. We thought also in the beginning that you know we're going to develop something great for the user experience, very well designed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we don't really care about the back end and if we gather the right data or not. And so pretty quickly we actually understood that it was as important to design the front end very well as well as the, 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 the back end so that you get all the data that you want and then it's great <laughs> because then you have full visibility on actually what you, you, you couldn't see before. Yeah, I'd like to know how you, what tools do you use to measure the client satisfaction? Imagine if you can't uh, call everybody and ask what they think, or you, you don't send surveys. Um, how do you measure the satisfaction? Is it the number of times they go to the website or to your app per, per day? And the second question is, is satisfaction really important? Imagine they, they keep using the product and they're not satisfied. Is it really important that they are satisfied? Um, yeah, user satisfaction is important uh, as long as the users that you're trying to please um, are the ones that are responding. Because when, w w so if you make a decision and you, you want to start, you want to stop, stop working with uh, startups, for example, and then you do things that you know startups won't like in your product, you made a decision. So. Then startups are going to come back, they're going to respond to the, to the NPS, and they're going to, um, to, to rate you pretty, pretty badly. But it doesn't matter, because actually you don't, you've made this decision. So I think uh, NPS is important to break down the NPS by different segments to see who promotes you and who doesn't, uh, and who doesn't like you. Uh, because sometimes it's not the users that you want that uh, don't like you, so it doesn't matter. Um, and so, yeah, today we use um, a, a tool called Satismatter to, but we may change. So um, 
this is just to, to answer your question. Uh, it, it works pretty well because it's embedded. Um, if you sell a tool about NPS, you <laughs> can buy it. Yeah, uh, but uh, we've not found the, the perfect tool yet, so if you have any suggestions, by the way, um, happy to hear. Yeah, and uh, at Fredlink, of course, we uh, we track the, the Net Promoter Score, uh, but basically, yeah, we are working with big corporates. Uh, we don't have like thousands and thousands of customers. We work with 300 uh, top European customers. Uh, so basically, we, we, we know if they are happy or not. What is really important for us is that we have different level of use of our product. You get the operational that is on the warehouses that orders the trucks every day and, and, and track the shipment on, on our software. But we also work with, with, the, with the purchase department to uh, build a data-driven purchasing and, and dynamic pricing, uh, uh, new way to buy transport and to manage transport. And with them, we, we, we provide them with the different products. And we also have the logistic director and, the, the, and the, 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 let's say the, the uh, are we are we call that department the RSE department that want to get figures on uh, how much CO2 we save etc. So basically now what we are trying to 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 um, to be uh, we are trying to be more and more granulated on our not promoter score to say okay uh, the, the the guy from the warehouse can be very satisfied because he can order the trucks in one click and get services etc. But maybe that all the services that we provide to the purchase department or RSC department or logistic department etc. Maybe they are not as happy, so now we are trying to um, to really build a product for the different end user that we will have, and to build different promoter score uh, on the different uh, end user that we have. Hi, um, at the very early stages of your startup, so when you were building the product, or maybe even before when we when you were validating your solution, how were you leveraging data, and uh, were you firstly leveraging data, and if so, how? Um, <clears throat> so in the beginning, yeah, as I said, the, we, we, we set up Salesforce pretty early, but otherwise um, nothing much. Um, but I think it's very different because if you, if you launch a, a, a consumer company, I think that you will want to track um, things about the usage uh, a lot more than if you, track a, if you, if you launch a startup, uh, a marketplace, sorry, um, because the, for us, what was important is, are our users autonomous on the product or not? Are they calling us? Are they not calling us? How can we improve things? That was the signal. And then we used uh, our CRM to actually um, uh, track the, 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 the commercial uh, performance. Um, so that's what we did in the beginning. And then we built a, a stack, a data stack in the product. Um, which was very, very important and we changed a lot of things um, because then we could cross the data that we got from our CRM with the data that we got from our product and then get very, very good data. Um, that came in a, in a second stage. Uh, we could have done this uh, earlier, um, I think, but you know, in the beginning when you're just in survival mode, it's just one, one KPI and you try to do your best to, to survive. Um, and I think that's, it should be the focus for sure. Not the same. <laughs> um, yeah, there are two. Uh, from a data perspective, I think that and that, that's interesting to have this discussion with Pierre because we uh, uh, there is really the data in our model. There is really the data is part of our the business that we provide our customer with. So I really like make the distinction between the data that we provide with our customer with and the data that we build internally. They have always always this trade off that at the you know, over the past three years we have different methodology and different approach. Uh, Sometimes we we really use uh, uh, on shell tools that we found on the market because we were like, okay, it takes like three, four, five months to build like a, a stack or, or, or a data stack and, and basically that's not the focus that we have in the next quarter. So there are some really like really nice tools that you can find uh, on, on Shell uh, that you can use plug to your system, etc. to get some really relevant data. Um, and there are other topics and I, I'm, more, I'm more talking about like the, the, the management of our op everyday operation that we quickly decided to build on our back end uh, because basically that was our core business and that was like that was 
really important for us to get a good understanding about our operation and the way we, we work every day, what happened on the shipment, uh, uh, the way the, the, the trucking companies automatically accept the different offers online, etc. the way they manage to, uh, to work with the driver, etc. There, so there are many data that, uh, that were core of our business and of our strategy and that really drove our strategy that we quickly managed to get on our back end with our, of course, uh, uh, web developers in our team. Uh, and there are some data that we say that's really important uh, as well. But basically, uh, it's something that we prefer, uh, we, we prefer to plug a, a tool on it and get the, because we need, we need to get the, 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 the figures and we need to, to, to have an, uh, a good understanding on, on those figures. But basically, we don't want to spend six months. There are other topics. So, and it also answer your question. It's about the trade-off that you are being the, the famous make or buy uh, strategy. Are you going to, to use an existing tool or build your own? Basically, that depends on your on your business. I'm a really industrial B2B business, and that exactly that's not the same if you build a B2C and where you have to track like a thousand, if thousand of customer from D1 that you don't understand and you don't see anything if you don't have a, a really strong dashboard to 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 analyze the different cohort that you have on your business, etc. Basically, we we start working with three, four, five. Six, 10, 20 customers, but basically we didn't have to, to work with like thousands of, uh, of customers. So at some point we say, okay, just plug a, an existing tool and we get like just, just the couple of data that we know to this point. But bas basically in operations, uh, uh, there are some like process and, and data that we need to build a company and to understand are we going on that way or that way. And basically we decided to really focus our dev team and our data science team uh, to build the back end and to get a full visibility on those operations. So it really depends on, on your company and what you, when you need to, to achieve. Hi. Uh, so I have two questions. One, um, how uh, young were you when you first did, went to your VC? Um, what stage were you, you know, with your product? And the second is, if you have a company um, with a killer idea, uh, no revenues for like two or three years, but based on data, how do you convince, convince your VC to uh, invest, uh, invest in you, you know? The first thing that I would uh, say is that uh, a killer ID is not enough. Everyone has ID every day, but there is a big gap between having an ID and make it true uh, because it's like fundraising, building a, your co-founding team, building a product, and, and that's something that we learn very f quickly at the family is that, yeah, you have one ID, but everyone has an ID, and basically, um, everyone had the ID of Uber, everyone had the ID of like uh, Airbnb that's pretty, Everyone has at some point have the ID and have a killer ID, but when you have an ID, you have thousands of people around the world that have the same ID, uh, or, or it's just like, if, if, if it's not the case, it's just that it's not a good idea, or, or, or just uh, uh, that you won't find a product market fit. But if there is a product market, market fit, basically, if there is a need and a problem to be solved, you are not the only one guy that see that there were a problem to be solved and that is trying to, to do that. So basically, I don't believe in the killer ID that no one had and shh, don't say it's a great idea, I'm going to build a big startup. Basically, no. If you have that idea, that many people have that idea, but what will make the difference at the end of the day is the guy who just like build a company. Um, that's the first thing that I want to say. Uh, and to answer you, your question, uh, when we um, went to see uh, the, 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 the VC, I was uh, 27 or 28. Ah, the, 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 the company, so how old are, are where we? Uh, the, yeah, we, I can tell you, uh, we were pretty young when we see the, was 25. the VC. He it, it was 25. Um, uh, the, the company was uh, raised in the, basically VCs raised uh, uh, love money at the beginning. Uh, we had uh, 100K from one our co-founder from the industry that, uh, pr that gave us 100K to, to build, start building the product. Um, and we raised a 500K seed round in the first uh, year. Um, and we raised the first professional round uh, with VCs uh, April 2017. Uh, so that was like almost uh, 18 months uh, after we start. 18 months ago, two years ago. Yeah, and uh, we were um, six months, uh, around six months uh, old. 
And um, yeah, we had followed only w one thing, um, the number of, um, of uh, invoice towers uh, on site, and we knew that we had to get to a certain point, and so we worked very hard to uh, get to that point and then go uh, fundraise. Uh, and then we started to have some visibility on other data, but I don't think in seed it's that important. Um, it's about the team, it's about the you know, um, momentum, the, the market and, and the product. Um, and the traction, and the traction of this single data that you're going to track, which is revenue or number of users, depending on uh, what, what your business is. <coughs> and then uh, for, for, for the company, I, I don't know, if it's just an idea, yeah, of course, execution is key. Um, and then if it's something that you've already created, it's pre-revenue, pre if it's based on data, then if you have some data, then I don't know, uh, go see uh, uh, a VC try to raise, you'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and. So the, the first thing about the data is uh, I just bounce on it because that's really interesting. Uh, today you can launch a product with a uh, like couple of hundreds euro and some data. Um, before building your product, today you can raise, uh, uh, you won't raise a 10 million check for the first uh, fundraise, but basically today everyone uh, can be an entrepreneur. Uh, sure. Uh, and uh, look, look at us. Uh, everyone can be an entrepreneur and you can like start it with almost nothing. You just go on, uh, on AdWord, you put 200 euro on AdWord and you put a landing page saying, I'm selling that product. And you have everyone clicking on that, and you are just able to see oh, to the to, to, to investors. Look, I, I, I didn't I, I didn't build a product, but look, I just put 200 euro on AdWord, and I have 1,000 people that clicked the last night. So maybe we should build that product, and I will need some money to build that product. That's the way you build a startup today. Um, uh, about uh, you want to add something, uh, Pierre? Yeah, yeah, because the, the the problem of not having enough money to actually keep going with the product is going to stay for a long time. You see, uh, so the whole the whole. <laughs> The whole point is, is, is to understand where you need to be to raise. And so this, uh, a lot of people can help. Um, and, um, and then you need to figure out a way to finance your way there and to work your way there also, because it's a lot of work when you don't have much money. Uh, and then hopefully you manage to raise the first round. And then the question will be, where should I, should I be when I will have invested all this money and then that's how it works. And are you sure that well, when you are going to loan because you, are, you have a killer idea and you are sure uh, in your room that it's the next product, but how, the, how can you be sure? So the, the, and just like a few words about that, the first startup that I, that, I, that I started, I was 20 years old and the, the, the funny thing is that I spent uh, six to eight months on the website without knowing if someone would buy it at the end of the day. But I, I was like really focused and build the product, the website, go to see the lawyer to say, we are going to build a billion company. So, you know, we need to have the legal thing really clear, etc. I spent a lot of time to see the lawyer, to build my website, to make everything perfect. And after eight months, when I launched the product, no one cares about my product. And the company, I killed the company in two weeks. The problem is that before building your product, won't you be sure that someone is going to buy your product? And that really makes the difference between the French uh, entrepreneurs and the US entrepreneur. When, we speak, when you talk with a French entrepreneur, he will tell you, I, build, I have an incredible idea, that's the first thing that he tells you. And the second thing, I'm going to build an incredible product. And for hours, he talks about the product and we have some incredible features, etc., etc. And at the end of the day, okay, and do you sell it to someone? Or no, no, I'm on loan in my, my my room, don't tell anyone, etc. When you meet a, non, a, a US entrepreneur, the guy tells you, we are leading the way all around Europe and all around the world. We are building something, everyone is interesting. Bill Gates even called me yesterday to tell me that it was incredible, we are going to raise a huge Series A, etc. And about your product, well, we didn't even start. It's a question of mindset. You, you make sure that, that you have a product market fit and, and make sure that someone is going to buy your product before you build. Today, it's just a question of money of, uh, and, and, and basically, if you have the right, uh, uh, if, you are, if, if you want to build, a, the, 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 if you solve the right problem, because it's all about that, and there is 
a problem on the market and you, and you manage to get the right founding team and that you show, you show with the data that someone is going to buy your product, after you, you can raise funds and it's not a problem to raise funds, I would say, I, I, to advise you, I, I, I would tell you, don't raise more money to build your product. Uh, raise more, uh, try to show the data and try to show that at some point uh, you are going to sell your product and that you have a real product market fit and many, many people are interested in. And if you get that, you will manage to get money from a VC to tell you, okay, it's all about getting two or three more developers to finish the features. But the worst, the worst scenario would to spend more and more money and more time on your product and at the end say, okay, I launch my product and just no one cares about my product. That's, that's the thing that you don't want to, to, to do. Yeah, I really think it's uh, important to get out of the building, meet uh, potential customers or run tests with landing pages, etc. Because before you've done that, you don't know what product to build, actually. Uh, it might sound great in your head, uh, but... Uh, you will probably uh, it will probably be difficult then when you launch and you realize that no one wants it. Why, why you, you don't like, just put a landing? Why, why don't you say that your product is finished? You don't care that it's not what no one cares basically. You just just say that your product is finished <laughs> and just. Uh, we, we we will find a way. Don't worry. Don't worry. Basically, just say that your product is finished. D don't tell anyone. And I, 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 when we finish the the, the 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 event, you just go to see anyone and say, we, "Okay, my, my my product it will be ready. Don't worry. Next week, the week after, but it's okay. It's going to be. We are making the final test. You know. And just ask people if they are going to buy it. If everyone in the room tells you, "Okay, that was a killer ID. I'm going to buy your product." Just tell them, "Okay, give me like a couple of months and and." Let's finish that product together because I will need your expertise to, to, uh, to, to build the product. So just make sure that all of them are going to buy your product. And if you manage to get everyone on board and if every one of them buy your product, don't worry, you will find a couple of hundred thousand to, to finish your product. But if you ask anyone that, and then everyone tells you, no, we, we don't care about your product, you will save time and money and, that's, and go to another project. There are thousands of things to do. And Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you.